Good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing today? Good, good. I am so excited to be with you guys this morning. If we haven't met, I'm Emmanuel Escobar. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Beach Church. Uh, my job is essentially is to help create opportunities that allow you guys to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. And I pray that that's exactly what happens this morning. That this isn't just another Sunday service for you. That this isn't just another part of a religious tradition. But that instead you, ex you encounter God this morning and that you see your life transformed by it. So I'm really excited about it, to continue this series and so you get what you deserve. Uh, before we do that, I want to do two things. One, I want to encourage you guys. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but every Monday morning, we have a meeting in the green room behind that giant wall. Uh, and what that meeting consists of is we get together to both plan future services in the month and also talk about the things that both went well in our Sunday service that week and things that we can improve on to reduce the distractions that you guys experience and, and hopefully heighten the chances of you being impact, impacted by the Holy Spirit. And while we're having these meetings, we talk about wins and we talk about losses, right? And one of the things that uh, was brought up last week that I thought, you know what, I want to make sure that you guys all hear from us. As the staff that gets to serve you week in and week out, we're in that room and we're talking about how just amazing it has been to see a very real spiritual maturing taking place in our church. To see all of you guys draw closer to the Spirit of God. We're seeing it through the giving. We're seeing it through people saying yes to serving opportunities. We're seeing through people healing in relationships and experiencing God more closer than ever before. So all I wanted to say was one, thank you. And two, don't stop. Keep running after Jesus. Our King is worth it. He is worth it. Yes, don't stop. God wants to continue to do a work in you. Do not relent in pursuing him. And thank you. I believe as Paul talks about, I wish I could remember exactly which specific church, but he talks about how it is a joy every time he thinks about them. It's easy to pastor these people. And I want you guys to know that from the staff to us, it is a joy to pastor you all. It is easy to pastor you guys to see the work that God is doing in y'all's life, all right? Now, the second thing I wanted to do was pray. So let's go to the presence of God and have him have his way here. Holy Spirit, we love you. We worship you. And thank you for your presence, God. We do not take it for granted. We don't make less of it. Holy Spirit, we eagerly, Invite your presence in this room today. Holy Spirit, I pray that it is not a cohesive thought and a good argument that convinces somebody that you are true. But it is the power of your Holy Spirit that transforms people into a deeper relationship with you. Jesus, I pray that you come in and that you impact people today. Holy Spirit, have your way. We yield to you. But it's not my message that transforms hearts, but it is your presence that sets us in a relentless pursuit of you. In the name of Jesus, we love you, God. We worship you. Thank you, Holy King. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't worry, the ceiling is not falling, it's just the air conditioning. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as I was saying, guys, I'm so excited to be here. We're continuing a series on uh, things that Jesus never said, and I'm really excited to tackle this specific one of you get what you deserve. <coughs> Excuse me, I stole Pastor Jerry's cough. Um, <laughs> really excited to tackle this one. The reason that I'm excited to tackle this one is because like many other ones, it sounds like it's kind of right, right? You get what you deserve, Karma, what goes around comes around. If you had an uncle or a dad, a tío, they'll say it all the time, like, you know, play dumb games, win dumb prizes, right? Like, you know, <clears throat> what goes comes around, it sounds right. Or my, my personal favorite one in this, in the Christian circle, you reap what you sow, right? 
It sounds so close to true. In fact, we did a whole series on sowing and reaping, right? You guys remember? And we talked about the very real and very true biblical principle that is sowing and reaping. However, what I want to do today is I want to look under the hood of the idea and the emotion of you get what you deserve. Because when we actually look at it, when we actually lift a hood, we begin to smell the stench of religion and the stench of humanistic mindsets that say, I can try really hard and achieve. So I want to make sure that before I start, I'm very clear. I am not saying that there is no consequences to your actions. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying that when it comes to the kingdom of God, you get what you deserve doesn't really stand. We'll talk about that here in a second. This is why I believe it doesn't really stand. You should probably get this. In reality, when you look at you get what you deserve, it speaks of a theology that says you got to do before you be. You got to do for God before, than you, before you are with God. It is better to do for God than it is to be with God. And this has been religion throughout centuries, not just Christian religion, but religions across the world consistently echo the same message, do for God, do enough for God, and eventually you will get to be with God. You reap what you sow. You're a good person, you will get good things. After all, in our westernized religion, we have a very strong sense of justice, We expect fairness, am I right? We expect, we demand a fair deal. If I have worked very hard for this, therefore I must get that. And those people that haven't done a single thing, they definitely don't deserve the price. Because they have not worked for it. They will get what they deserve. And if they have done nothing, they deserve nothing. And unfortunately, this mindset creeps into our faith, and into the way that we treat other people. We begin to believe that if I tithe more, if I serve more, if I attend more, if I read my Bible more, then surely I will get more good things from God. And those people, where their life is falling apart, well, surely they are not tithing, they're not serving, they're not blah, 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 because they're getting what they deserve. But this is why this statement is so flimsy. What happens to the person that has been doing all the right things, and then they lose their child? What happens to the person that has been doing all the wrong things? And they get pregnant before you get pregnant, and that's what you've been eagerly awaiting for. Hmm. Maybe you don't get what you deserve. Maybe that's not as accurate of a saying, and in reality, when we look at it, we see that the statement, you get what you deserve, is a statement fueled by ego. A statement of us attempting to convince ourselves that we are good enough to be accepted and loved by God. And see, there's a problem with that. And this is quite, it's quite opposite of what Jesus said. Because if we could achieve God on our own, we wouldn't need Jesus. If I could be good on my own, if I could behave well enough to, uh, to approach and attract the grace of God, I would not need Christ. So you see, Jesus never preached, you get what you deserve. He actually preached quite the opposite. Because the truth of the matter, when we live in the world of you get what you deserve, There's good guys and there's bad guys, and when bad things happen, it's because you were bad, and when good things happen, it's because you were good, because after all, you get what you deserve. But Jesus never preached that. 
So let me speak some hope into you. If you're tired, if you're ragged, if you're wondering what your life is falling apart, and all you're looking at right now is the long list of mistakes you've made, I have some very good news for you. Because Jesus never said you get what you deserve. Jesus said this. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the first thing Jesus preached in his public ministry. So Jesus spent all this time in the desert fasting, and he went through all these trials, being tempted, and the devil offering him the world. And Jesus said, no, my God's will matters more. And he stayed consistent and pursuing the will of God. And after he came through all of that hard labor, he didn't preach, do good things. He didn't preach, be like me, resist. You can do it. You got this. Jesus didn't preach, if you would fast enough, you would know God. Jesus didn't preach these things. Jesus comes out of 40 days of intense spiritual labor, and what he preaches is repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn from where you're heading and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is saying something deep and profound here. But I understand if this very first word, repent, gets in the way. I understand that for centuries this word has been used to manipulate people, to abuse people, to put them down, and to make them feel like less than. I understand that the word repent might put up the shield in your heart because the last time somebody shouted repent at you, it was not pretty. But I need you to understand that this isn't a manipulative person yelling this. This is the Son of God that died on the cross for your sins. So this is actually an invitation. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. He didn't preach do good because the reality is that no matter what we do, no matter how well we behave, no matter how much we tithe, how much we serve, how often you're in this building or watching online, no matter what, you deserve death. That's all you deserve. I don't deserve the marriage I have. I don't deserve the family that I have. I don't deserve all of you amazing and beautiful people. I don't deserve this job. I don't care how long I've been walking with God. The only thing... I deserve is death. So you know what? Thank God it's not you get what you deserve because the only thing we would receive is this. Thank God that we're liberated by our king to get something more. Book of Romans says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. This changes things. This changes repent from a big scary word that someone beat you with into a beautiful invitation. Because Jesus is saying repent for the kingdom of God is near, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. Jesus is saying, repent and reach for the kingdom that is near. I paid for it. I paid for you to have a close and intimate relationship with Jesus. You deserve nothing but death. Mother Teresa, death. Gandhi, death. Pastor Jerry, death. Me, death, you, death. That's all. That's all we deserve. 
That's all we could possibly muster in our best efforts, in our most kindest moments, our moments of generosity and absolute selfless love. The best thing we could hope for is death. But it's that beautiful, beautiful but. <laughs> but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You deserve nothing but death, but good news. Jesus has given you a gift. And that gift is life. And the way we access that gift is by repentance. Repentance is not a heavy word. Repentance is the key that allows us to access what God has given us. So this is why Jesus preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He is giving us a key. Saying this is how you access the kingdom of God. This is how you access what you don't deserve. This is how you access the truth that God has given you. And this has been the plan from the very beginning. This was not a plan B. This was not a God, ooh, I thought these people were going to turn out good and they're kind of crazy. <laughs> Guess I got to figure something out. Hey, Jesus, what you doing on Sunday? Like. <laughs> That's not what happened. It's actually quite beautiful. Do you know that God chose to give himself for you? It's funny because religion will argue circles around whether we choose God or not. And I'm like, sure, do that. I don't care. You know what amazes me is that he chose us. Wow, that's what blows my mind. That's what blows my mind, that he chose us. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. God is no longer angry at you. Hear me. All the bad things you've done all these years have not made your debt to God any worse. He is not angry at you. Hear me. All the great things you have done all these years has not made your debt any less. But he's not angry at you. Instead, Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. Sin says you owe death. If you get what you deserve, all you get is death. But Jesus says you don't get what you deserve, you get what I paid for. Yes. You don't get what you deserve. Thank God I don't get what I deserve. Thank God I can have a marriage abundantly better than I deserve. Thank God that I can have a job abundantly better than I deserve. Thank God that I can have an eternal life that is not what I deserve, but I get what Jesus paid for. This breaks beyond religion. This breaks beyond behave and do well. This breaks into a place in which you no longer owe anything. So any type of kindness, love, and reaction that you have towards other people is coming out of an overflow of God's generosity and kindness towards you. So I can't hold anything over you. As a pastor, I can't condemn you for not coming to church. As a believer of God, I can't condemn you for saying bad words. I can't hold anything over you because you owe God nothing. I have no control over you. Only the Spirit of God. So if something convicts you of your sins, let it be the presence of of God, not an angry man. 
If something convinces you that you must draw closer to your king, let it be thankfulness for this generosity that gets you life not death. It is out of gratitude that I repent. It is a beautiful action to repent. It is not something you do beaten and destroyed. It is something you do with joy, for I deserve nothing but death. Yet God gave me life. Repent. Turn away from what you're doing. Turn away from how you think. If you think God is mad at you, repent. If you wish he would care for you, repent. If you're in a broken relationship that is dragging you far from God, repent. It's not an angry, scary thing. It's a beautiful key to access the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus said, repent and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near, it wasn't an angry threat. It was a promise. A promise full of eager joy and expectation of turn to me, I have made heaven accessible. It wasn't before there was no hope that your debt could ever be settled. But through my death, you can repent and access the kingdom of God. Repentance is the key not to get what you deserve, but to get the life that God has for you. Repentance is the key not to get what you deserve, but to get the life that God has for you. Do you want a better marriage? Repent. Go to God. Hey, God, I have what I deserve right now. She won't even look at me. I don't want what I deserve. I want what you paid for. Will you please have me? Hey, wife, I understand I have what I deserve. And I'm not saying I'm going to do better. What I'm saying is I am sorry. Will you please help me walk closer to God? You want better relationships? Repent. Better job? Repent. An actual loving partner that will walk with you and guide you towards Jesus? Repent. It's the key to receiving the life that God has for you. Let me share with you guys how I experienced this in my life not too recently. <coughs> Excuse me. So as you guys may know, some of you may know, uh, my family and I recently moved down to Florida from Tennessee. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> we moved down uh, from Tennessee down to Florida. Did I say that right? Anyhow. Uh, and so we've never experienced a hurricane, you know, or at least I have. And my wife is uh, kind of a bit of a native, so she had... So I'm like freaking out. I'm like, what do we do? It's a hurricane that's coming, right? I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I'm like texting Pastor Kerry. I'm like, how does this work, man? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what's going on. So uh, we, we went through that hurricane that came, or I guess one of them. I think we had two or three. I don't even know. Uh, went through that hurricane. And what I didn't realize is that during that time, and now in retrospective, I'm like, I probably didn't help the situation. But uh, my son had a lot of anxiety because of that hurricane, a lot of fear around that hurricane. We went through it, and we were okay. And then a couple weeks later, uh, I had a very hard day at work. And yes, pastors have those as well. Uh, I was just ready to come home, and all I wanted to do was just hang out with my wife. Uh, just, I'm like, I just want to sit there, look at you, you're pretty, and just kind of like have all the problems melt away. Like, I just want to hang out with my wife. And uh, bought, came home and did the dad thing. I have a seven-year-old son, so, you know, hung out with him, and we did the thing. And he was particularly kind of whiny that day, so I should have known something was cooking. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm not one that 
I don't do kids, y'all. Like, <laughs> just being real. And I know I say this just about every time I'm up on stage. I'm just making sure that I never get asked to pastor the children's ministry. <laughs> But I don't do kids. I don't know how to do kids. We joke that my son is secretly a 62-year-old man, uh, and that's how he behaves. And I'm like, thank God that he's not just like a regular kid, because I don't know that I could handle that, right? Like, we literally have conversations about, like, crypto and the metaverse. Like, that's the conversations between my son and I, you know what I mean? (laughs) So, you know, I'm like, you know, thankfully he is that way. But nonetheless, he's still a seven-year-old kid, and and during this day, he was a little bit particularly whiny, and it was time to put him to bed. And, and parents, you guys know, that's like the golden hour, right? When the kid goes to bed, and you're like, you can breathe a little bit deeper, right? Like put your comfy shoes on, you're good. You don't got to clean anything anymore, right? So I'm like looking at that finish line. I'm like, I'm going to get there. I'm going to put that boy to bed. I'm going to hang out with my wife. I'm like looking forward to it, right? So it's time for bed. I'm like, all right, get in bed, you know, <laughs> quickly, get in there, quickly, go to bed. And uh, he goes to bed, and I'm like, finally, I sit on the couch with my wife, and we're uh, hanging out, chatting, and it was just one of those nights where he keeps getting out of bed and keeps coming out, and, and he was whiny too. It wasn't just, I'm getting some water. He does that. I don't know why he likes to let us know what's happening. He's like, I'm getting water. I'm like, all right, man, cool. Uh, I don't know. He does that. <laughs> But this particular time, he was just whiny and whiny, and, and I was getting very fed up. And um, I'm not proud of this. Um, the umpteenth time he gets out of bed, I yell at my kid. And I uh, actually went a little bit further, and I said something along the lines of, if you get out of bed again, you're going to have to deal with me. So I threatened my kid. Not very proud of that moment, if I may be real. My kid is a very sensitive soul, to be honest. He processes things. So just remember his face wide with fear, which is never what I want to see in my child's face. And uh, he goes back to his room, climbs on his bed. And I can just hear the anger coming out of his room. And I immediately hear the Holy Spirit say, can you please give your son a minute of your time? God. My head dropped immediately. I knew I had messed up. So in that moment, I repented. I know what I deserve. See, you got to understand that I didn't really have a dad. And for the longest time, I wasn't interested in having children because I wasn't interested in replicating that trauma. I'm like, I'm not interested in messing up another child. No, thank you. I am enough. I don't need to have another messed up person walking around this world. So it actually took a lot of healing from God for me to even get to a place where I'm like, okay, I I would love to have a kid, and then I had a boy, and I'm like, oh, man, of course it's a boy, not a girl, right? Like, I feel like a girl, I don't know why, I don't know, I don't know why, but I feel like a girl would have probably, like, been maybe easier for me just with my experience with my dad, but of course it's a son, so it's just a mirror, right? A mirror of my relationship between me and my father, and I'm just like, I just messed it up. I deserve the anger that is coming out of that room. I deserve that young man not wanting to speak to me. I deserve that young man not trusting me. But in that moment, I prayed and I said, God, I know I deserve the hurt that I've caused on that child. But I pray that you don't allow that hurt to take root. I pray that I get not what I deserve, but what you paid for which is a loving relationship with my only son. So I had that conversation with Jesus. I went to his room, and I tell him, Son, I am sorry. I should not have yelled at you, and I should have definitely not threatened you. That is not okay for me or for anyone else to do. 
I am very sorry. You still need to stay in bed. Right? Right? Because here's the thing. God's grace does not negate his truth. God's love, mercy, and kindness does not negate the very real and healthy boundaries that he has placed in our life for our own good. Right? So here's the thing. I'm apologizing to my son, but that doesn't negate that he still needs to stay in bed. But you see, me being repentant to him allowed him to actually hear me. So I tell him, son, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have yelled at you. I shouldn't have threatened you. That is not okay. That is not what God wants me to do. What is going on, dude? And that opened up for a beautiful discourse about his fear that he was fearing about a hurricane. He thought he was going to get sucked out of the window. That opened up for this beautiful moment between my son and I to be able to speak about trusting God and trusting that God is good and wants the best things for him and trusting that when things go wrong, that God has still promised to be alongside of us no matter what. It was just a beautiful moment of discipleship that I did not deserve. Repentance paved the way for healing. And that is the relationship between my son and I. That is the relationship between my wife and I. It is a constant cycle of repentance and grace, repentance and grace, repentance and grace. And that is how we have the family we do not deserve. Because repentance gives me the key to access the kingdom of God. So what do we do with this information? What's the next step for you? Well, one, if you have been committed to a life with Jesus and you served him and love him and you've been following him and you're like, I got the repentance thing, I want to invite you to allow repentance to seep into every aspect of your life. Not to see repentance as that one thing you did when you were a teenager and you gave to life to Jesus, but to see repentance as that everyday practice that allows you to draw closer to the heart of God. That if you see people and what you see is that they get what they deserve, to allow the Holy Spirit to change that in you, to kill that religion that makes you go, well, they're up to no good, so of course... And instead, for you to see the inherent value and treasure in every single human being, a treasure so precious that was worth the blood of Jesus Christ. That you turn to God and you say, God, transform me through repentance that I may experience you more closely. And if you're here and you haven't trusted God with your life, if all you've heard for so long is religious men wield this repentance word to beat you over the head and that has made you go, I want nothing to do with this wrathful God that is just waiting to strike me. That is not the kingdom. That is not the good news of the gospel. Instead, like our king, I want to invite you to repent. Turn to God. He's made his kingdom near. You can access it. All you have to say is, God, I don't want what I deserve. I want what you paid for. Take over my life. And this will begin a cycle of daily repentance that will have you looking more and more and more like Jesus every day. Let me pray for you, church, and let's stand to our feet and worship God. Holy Spirit, we love you. I pray that people answer the call to repentance today. Holy Spirit, I come to you and I repent for any affront towards you, for any time that I've belittled my fellow man, for any time that I thought myself higher than you, for any time 
that I bought the lie that I could somehow convince you that I was good enough. I repent to you. I exchange what I have. And I pick up what I don't deserve, which is what you paid for, Jesus. Holy Spirit, move in the hearts of our people today that we continue to draw closer and closer and closer to you. Jesus, have your way today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.